Okay, Phil, we are live, in case you hadn't noticed. Hello, everybody. Hi, uh, I'm Phil Wadler. I'm speaking to you from Edinburgh. Uh, I'm a senior research fellow at IOHK and also a professor at the University of Edinburgh. And it's my enormous pleasure to introduce Vince Cerf. He's a vice president and chief internet evangelist uh, at Google. I'm not going to go over all his accomplishments because if I did, we would have time for nothing else. <laughs> but I will give you a very brief introduction. He um, got his PhD from UCLA in 1972, joined the faculty at Stanford. By 1974, he had written his joint paper with Bob Kahn that uh, described what at that time was called the ARPANET and later came to be called the Internet. Uh, he went off with Khan in 1976 to start working at ARPA, the Advanced Research Projects Agency at the uh, U.S. Department of Defense, then went to MCI, where he worked on the first commercial email service. Uh, from 92 to 95, he was the founding president of the Internet Society. And from 2000 to 2007, he chaired ICANN, which allocates domain names. He won the, two th the Turing Award in 2004, uh, jointly with Bob Kahn, and uh, was appointed to Google in 2005. As you can see, he's well known as a snazzy dresser, and um, he's a distant cousin to the uh, well-known publisher and comedian Bennett Cerf. That's right. Um, and uh, if you want to read one of his uh, RFCs, the one I most recommend is Perry Encounters the Doctor. RFC 439 from January 1973, of which I still have fond memories. So I'm going to do a, a very short uh, personal introduction. Um, I actually know Vint because um, I was his undergraduate at Stanford at the time that he moved there as a faculty member. And he actually hired me to do some uh, work on the early internet. I think I wrote the very first computer game. We'll get back to that at the end. But um, I want to talk about the most important thing that I learned while at Stanford, which Vint taught me. And I'm gonna preface this with a video. So if wow. you could um, run the video. He thinks it's only nice to return the compliment. Bad language or abuse I never, never use, whatever the emergency. No bother it I may occasionally say. I never use a big, big D. What's never? No, never. What's never? Well, hardly ever. Hardly ever swells a big, big D. Then give three cheers and one cheer more for the well-bred captain of the pinafore. Then give three cheers and one cheer more for the captain of the pinafore. Right, so you just saw that video. That was uh, I Am the Captain of the Pinafore from HMS Pinafore by um, Gilbert and Sullivan. And the reason I ran that was, as I mentioned, I was working for Vint, and he was explaining to me this new idea, packet switching, which is what the internet is based on. And he started talking about reliability. He was explaining to me about drop packets. And suddenly, he starts singing to me this song. And he <laughs> says, you know, never, never use the big feet. Big, big D, what never, no, never, what never, well, no, hardly ever. ever. Right, as a way of explaining when packets get dropped. Do packets get dropped? Never, well, hardly ever. Hardly ever. <laughs> and that really stuck with me. That was, I think, one of the very first times I understood how important it was to use humor in communication. And that's, stuck with me throughout my whole career. So um, then I really want to say a big thank you to that. And anybody who's ever enjoyed one of my talks or enjoyed reading one of my papers, I think they may want to say a big thank you to you as well. So thank you. Well, you're very welcome, Phil. I have to say that uh, with a last name like Surf, uh, it's probably a genetic uh, you know, flaw. Uh, there, I never met a pun I didn't like. Uh, but I think your point's extremely well taken, that humor is often a wonderful way of 
helping people understand something and still and not feel you know overwhelmed by it, uh, which I hope we are able to introduce into our discussion today as well. Right. So, first question. I think you're prepared for this one since it's the title of the session: Designing the Internet. What would you have done differently? So uh, many people have asked this. I'm almost you know, there's this list. This is question number 121. Um, there are some things that I wish I could have done. Um, I'm not sure that I would have gotten away with it, but let's talk a little bit about there. There are three in particular. Um, the first and most obvious one for most people who are familiar with the internet is the, the address space. This is not the domain names, but this is the numeric address space, that, like an address, a, a postal address that tells you where things are uh, in the internet, where the termination points are. Uh, when Bob Kahn and I did the original design, we actually did a calculation to try to figure out, you know, how many termination points should we anticipate? We knew this had to be a global system uh, because it was intended to be a possible basis for the U.S. command and control network, which was needed to manage uh, military forces literally all over the globe, and of course also to interwork with uh, allies. So, uh, so we did a little back of the envelope calculation and we said, well, okay, so let's see. Uh, it has to be in every country. Uh, how many countries are there? And we didn't know what the answer was to that. And, uh, and there wasn't any Google to ask at the time. So we estimated 128 because that was a power of two and that's what programmers think in. So we said, okay, so how many networks uh, per country? And uh, we said, well, you know, there ought to be some competition. So how about two on the average uh, per country? So when you do the math, you get 256 networks, um, and uh, so that's eight bits. And then we said, how many computers will there be in each network? And, and remember, this is 1973 when computers were big, expensive things, and they were in air-conditioned rooms, and they didn't get up and move around. But we said, you know, well, how about 16 million or something? So um, in, the, in the end, uh, we had a, you know, a eight bits of network and 24 bits of, um, of host ID, that was a 32-bit number, and of course, if we could allocate that uh, absolutely, you know, uh, fully and, and densely, that would be 4.3 billion terminations. That was more than there were people in the world, and this was just an experiment. We didn't know if it was going to work, so we adopted a 32-bit address space. Uh, in the course of development, we went through four iterations of the design of the TCP protocols, and then TC we split IP off, so we had TCP IP. And we actually considered a larger address space and decided that um, it, it just didn't uh, pass the red face test. We considered 128 bits, and, but that's uh, 3.4 times 10 to the 38th addresses. And I couldn't imagine going to somebody and saying, I need 128 bits of address space to do this experiment. So we stuck with 32. It lasted until 2011, but the Internet Engineering Task Force recognized around 1992 that there, uh, we were consuming uh, the B class address space, especially very, very quickly. So we introduced IP version six after some arm wrestling uh, at 128 bits. So if I could have gone back uh, and been convincing about needing 128 bits of address space, it would have been nicer because <clears throat> the transition has been slow and, uh, and not as, uh, not as uh, efficient as I would have liked. On the other hand, that's a hell of a lot of bits for addressing, and we didn't have a lot of data rate available. It's a 50 kilobit backbone, and wasting a lot of time on addressing just didn't seem appropriate. So that's one thing that I wish we might have could have done, but I don't think I could have gotten away with it. The second thing uh, has to do with security, and of course, lots of people say, "You idiot! Why didn't you make a more secure system?" It, you know, it's falling apart all over everywhere, and headlines are all over the place. So you know, what's the matter with you? Well, the honest answer is that at the time, I had actually worked with the NSA on a version of the internet that could be secured, but the equipment we were using turned out to be classified and I couldn't share information uh, about it with people who didn't have clearances. So about 1976, which is about two years into the, before the point where we froze the uh, design in order to start get easy implementing it, um, the uh, a paper was published by uh, Marty Hellman and Whitfield Diffie, who were colleagues at Stanford, called on new directions in cryptography, if I remember right. And it was all about public key crypto. Uh, and of course, that was a powerful, very powerful uh, conceptual uh, shift 
in the way in which crypto worked, because up until then, the keys had to be symmetric. Everybody had the same key, which meant you could generate messages and claim the other guy did it. Whereas in the public key space, uh, the only party who can be uh, accused of having generated a particular object that's digitally signed is the one that has the private key that isn't shared. Uh, so uh, the public key crypto idea uh, really uh, struck me. However, there was no software and no algorithms readily available at that time. And so um, at this, by this time in 76, I'm at ARPA and I'm running the program and I really want to demonstrate its functional capability. So uh, we released the system without benefit of public key crypto. But that's retrofitable and has been, as you and many others know, I mean, we've got, we use it all the time in order to support HTTPS, TCP over TLS, IPsec, and all these other things have key distribution mechanisms that are very dependent on the public key crypto. Uh, there's one other little nuance, and since you're in Edinburgh um, and, uh, in the, uh, the general uh, region of the UK, uh, it's, it's, your listeners uh, should know that the public key crypto idea was actually discovered by GCHQ, which is the UK equivalent of NSA, somewhere around 1974, a couple of years before Witt and Marty uh, came up with the idea, but they didn't publish it because they wanted to keep it a secret because they were gonna use it for their own purposes and they didn't want anybody else to know about it. So they didn't get the credit that, uh, that Witt and Diffie did, uh, and uh, uh, Diffie, um, Witt, <laughs> Witt Diffie and Marty Hellman got, they eventually got the uh, the Turing Award and the Marconi uh, Prize as well for their work. So that's the second thing is I would have put more crypto in if I could have, but I am glad to say we could retrofit. The third thing is a little more obscure, and I, I know we don't want to consume too much time uh, uh, getting down into too many weeds, but the top level summary is that the first three networks of the internet were the original ARPANET, which is built with dedicated telephone circuits going, you know, linking the uh, packet switches together. But we knew for command and control, we were going to need computers and ships at sea and mobile vehicles and airborne uh, vehicles and couldn't use wires to tie them together. So uh, Bob Kahn had started, before I even got to uh, ARPA, had started working on a mobile packet radio system and a packet satellite system to go along with the ARPANET in order to serve that aspect of the command and control uh, uh, requirement. So uh, the packet radio system was built in the Bay Area and we had um, repeaters on the mountaintops, we had repeaters in mobile vehicles and a few other fixed locations. And I thought that when we demonstrated that you could drive around, uh, you had an IP address, the IP address never changed, but you got handed off from one router to, an, or one radio uh, router to another, uh, the system worked. And so I thought we'd solve the mobility problem, but what I have failed to take into account is that if you had multiple mobile systems and you move from one to the other and your IP address changed, the TCP connection, TCP IP connection would break because the IP addresses were no longer, you know, you got a new IP address and the other guy didn't know that. So uh, that was a mistake. And I wish I had really understood that uh, it's so stupid, really, when you when you think about it. Now, as a matter of fact, here it is 2020, and at Google, for other reasons, a new protocol was developed called QUIC, Q-U-I-C, which basically combines TCP and TLS into a single encrypted system with multiple channels that are each independently flow controlled, something that I did not do uh, in the early days of TCP because it, it would take up too much memory uh, and processing for the computers of the day. I actually considered it, but I didn't do it. But the quick protocol has the feature that there is a common crypto variable that both ends uh, generate. And that means if one of them changes the IP address, they can still validate themselves by saying, hi, it's still me and here's my crypto var variable to prove it. And so it actually solves at least a portion of that mobility problem. So those are the three things that I think I would do differently. Uh, we can't hear you, Phil, because you are muted. Someday I will learn to actually press the unmute button. Um, that's not what a, a PhD in computing <laughs> teaches you to do. So we've been joined by uh, Agelis Gallias, who is the um, chief scientist of IOHK and also my colleague as a professor at Edinburgh. And he's going to ask the first question. So, Agelis. Mm -hmm. All right, thanks, Phil, and thanks, Ben, 
for, for joining us in this session. It's a delight to have you here. So as a cryptographer, there are many questions about crypto that I could think right now and ask you with uh, all the things you said. But uh, I'd rather kick off uh, this, uh, you know, our set of questions with a question about governance, because I think it would be very beneficial for this community to have your insights on this. So the internet is a global common resource that requires oversight, governance, and large-scale coordination. And you contributed personally uh, in a major way to make this a reality. So something that we are all very grateful for. So currently in the blockchain space, we're deploying systems like Cardano that are supported by a growing international community that has aspirations to offer functionalities like smart contracts that will operate at the global scale. So what is your advice to this community and what are the lessons learned from your journey on how to govern successfully global scale projects? So let me, uh, let's using the internet as, uh, as a uh, hobby horse here in order to respond to the question, let me uh, first of all say that the word governance is a very, very broad term. At least I would like uh, us to use it in a broad way in this conversation. Uh, for example, there are such things as technical governance by which I might mean a set of agreed protocols because protocols govern your behavior. They determine how computers format things and how they exchange things and in what order your state changes occur and all that. So protocols are a kind of technical governance and they are absolutely essential. Agreeing on them and holding them in common is part of the reason the internet works. So that's one aspect of all this. And I would like to point out that we created institutions in order to respond to issues arising with regard to the use and spread of the internet as needed, as opposed to trying to invent them ahead of time or anticipate what they were. So for example, when Steve Crocker was leading the network working group on the ARPANET to do the host protocols, he created a very informal network working group, which eventually morphed into the Internet Engineering Task Force and the Internet Architecture Board, and now the Internet Research Task Force. Those those institutions got created as the need for them arose. The same thing could be said for the Internet Corporation for Assigned Names and Numbers. It was created in 1997 or 98 uh, in, in response to a need for more um, management, or more, uh, I would say, uh, organized management of the domain name system and the Internet address allocation system. Other organizations also got created, again, out of need. So the um, regional internet registries for distribution of IP addresses, assignment of IP addresses, came along. There are five of them in sort of a regional, uh, con uh, on a regional basis. And they were uh, created um, in order to bring order to the assignment, unique assignment of IP addresses to the people who were building networks and needed them. Uh, the uh, Internet Society was created again out of need. In this case, it was, in, it was a little amusing. We had a secretariat that uh, was funded by the National Science Foundation. It was run out of the Corporation for National Research Initiatives, which Bob Kahn started way back in 1985 or 86, and I joined around that time. So the um, uh, secretariat was run by uh, one of the uh, CNRI staff, and uh, somewhere along the line, I would, I'm, I'm going to guess around 1990 or so, NSF noticed that um, the, uh, there was a uh, cost associated with running the secretariat to assist the Internet Engineering Task Force with its uh, standards making activity. And, uh, and they said, but we're spending research money on that. But this is increasingly a commercial activity. Uh, you know, by this time, it, it, the World Wide Web has been announced. Uh, we're seeing commercial networking happen. So they, they said, uh, we aren't going to use research dollars for this anymore. You have to self-fund. And so Bob and I and others said, well, we have to invent some nonprofit thing which can house the secretariat and, and be self-funding. So we invented the Internet Society. And of course, uh, that was uh, in, we opened our doors uh, in uh, January, I think, of 1992, uh, and I served as the first president. So I, I won't go on on this, but the point here is that there are new institutions that got created in order to operate uh, the internet. Of course, companies got started, new networks and things like that. And then many applications, hardware developers, all of these things got created as need demanded. There is, however, another part which you clearly uh, wanted to um, address and want me to address, and that has to do with the way in which the internet is used. 
And here we run into much more complicated problems. The internet is a layered architecture. And so the layers are fairly well separated. Uh, the lowest layer, the physical layer, often involves um, what I would call um, typical telecommunications companies, cable companies, telephone companies that offer communication services uh, and which we treat in the internet uh, at the internet layer is sort of dumb pipes that just connect uh, packet switches together. Uh, so there are regulations associated with telecom carriers. And so that's a piece of governance. Then there are regulations associated with internet service providers. What can they do? What can they not do? And we get into big arguments over what's called net neutrality. You know, can you fiddle around with, uh, with the packets and interfere with somebody's application because you were competing with them? Um, and then I would prefer that to be a no-no. I consider that anti-competitive behavior. We've had big arguments about this in the US. So there are other arguments in other parts of the world. Uh, so we see um, governance with regard to uh, policy uh, to be a very big and complex space. In the Internet Corporation for Assigned Names and Numbers, for example, there is an endless array of multi-stakeholder consultation on policy development. And uh, at the United Nations, where normally you hear the word multilateral in the most recent um, couple of years, uh, a high-level panel on digital cooperation was uh, established by the Secretary General uh, Guterres and a report was submitted to the Secretary in June of last year uh, outlining issues and proposals for improved ability to generate governance uh, principles. Uh, and now most recently, after at the UN uh, 75th anniversary announcement in uh, June, just this past June, um, the Secretary General released a uh, roadmap for digital cooperation, uh, RIT Global. I mean, this is a, these are open possibilities for improving uh, the development of governance principles and potentially institutions. So that leads us to uh, one last point, which is that uh, when you see a phenomenon like the Internet, which is rich in its evolution, it's rich in new ideas, new applications, it is a very, very open architecture. It invites people to invent new ways of using it, and they do. But this also introduces new kinds of governance concerns. What do we do about misinformation and disinformation in social media? What do we do about malware, which is propagating through the network? What do we do about someone in one country harmed by someone in another country where we have jurisdictional divides, in some cases international? Uh, and, and how do we deal with law enforcement in that case? What kinds of agreements should we have for uh, commonality on digital signatures? How much weight do we give a digital signature uh, in a court of law where there's a dispute over a contract that was digitally signed by two parties who never met each other? I mean, I, and, you know, rattle, rattle, I just go on and on here. So um, for anyone who is interested in governance, there is simply a wide open space here for hard work and, and for uh, international agreements in order to um, manage this very complex and very, very rich uh, environment that we call the internet and the World Wide Web. Thanks for that. That touches on several points that I think we'll get to. So uh, lots of people have been putting up great questions on Reddit. Let me give you the first one from WLFNMN. Which is more dangerous? Facebook and Google or China? Wow, um, this is <laughs> this is sort of like when did you stop beating your wife? Um, <laughs> I think I think that if there are dangers at all, um, and and perhaps there are, they are not all the same. Uh, it is not unusual to see uh, concentrations of. Um, of capacity in the commercial markets. This happens a lot um, in the automobile uh, manufacturing market. For example, in the US, there were three large manufacturers. There were hundreds of them when the automobile was first created, just like there were many different network providers. Uh, but over time, there are economies of scale that often uh, dictate that the number of actors, uh, successful actors in the market will diminish over time. Uh, so there is vigorous uh, competition still in the internet space, even though the person asking the question might feel there should be more. Um, 
so the thing that we should be uh, thoughtful about is to make sure that users have choice. And, uh, and here I think it's very important to recognize that the successes of some of the internet-oriented companies uh, is not guaranteed, nor is it necessarily guaranteed to persist forever. And so we've seen some very successful internet uh, entities uh, diminish in, uh, in their uh, visibility and success over time. And so uh, Google, of course, and Facebook and others are uh, equally uh, at risk, uh, which is why as one of the Google executives, I feel like we have to keep running like crazy because there's probably ten, a couple of students in some dorm somewhere just like you know, Larry Page and Sergey Brin inventing something better than we have. And so, uh, so the answer is, um, I don't think we are as dangerous as the question implies. Uh, because we're, we are just like everybody else driven by the potential of innovation that will under, undermine, you know, whatever our business model happened to be. China is an interesting alternative and we don't have time for, you know, a complete dissertation here. China has invested <clears throat> very, very heavily in the internet. It's certainly a country that has the largest population of internet users per capita. Uh, anywhere in the world. There must be at least 800 million, possibly as many as a billion users. Not only that, they've invested in the infrastructure and they have companies which are big like Alibaba, for example, and WePay and, and other, or WeChat and others uh, that are comparable in scale to some of the Western uh, country, uh, companies that have grown up in the internet space. On the other hand, uh, China has exhibited a philosophy which is less than open, uh, in fact, dramatically less uh, and surveillance uh, is an, uh, an increasingly significant component of the way in which they've chosen to implement the internet or the way in which they've chosen to implement applications on the internet. And so in that sense, uh, there are some risk factors, um, especially if their sense of, uh, of internet uh, propagates more broadly uh, as opposed to the Western openness uh, view of the internet. Uh, so we can already see that there are some regimes other than the Chinese that are also interested in controlling uh, and or observing what their population does, uh, limiting what they can see or what they can say. Uh, and to the extent that that becomes common or more common, uh, I think it's harmful to the fundamental philosophy of the internet, which has always been to keep it open, allow it to continue to evolve, allow people to share information, uh, and to uh, uh, essentially accelerate progress by virtue of that sharing. I remember to unmute that time. Thank you for that answer. There's a follow-up question here from, uh, again, from Reddit, something who goes by the name Rody Dick. I'm not sure if I'm allowed to say that under our, uh, uh, the way we run these things, but on we go. Question is, on the internet, no one knows you're a dog. How can we address the explosion of misinformation? And does blockchain help? Uh, so uh, first of all, let me take that last bit. I am a well-known blockchain skeptic. Somebody asked me, you know, uh, what about blockchain? And I said something like run the other way. Uh, now to be fair about this, blockchain is a technology. Uh, it is roughly speaking, a um, an I theoretically immutable distributed database. And it has some useful properties. Uh, I have not seen it scale terribly well. There are people who argue that there are sort of parallel blockchain systems that could be generating uh, or capturing transactions in parallel, and then you build a kind of a Merkle tree to, to bind them all together. And so perhaps you could, you could achieve higher capacity, higher transaction rates than I have seen before. We use it at Google, for example, in the uh, certificate transparency uh, application. So, uh, so it's not like it's simply uh, anathema or stupid or anything else, but it might work uh, only under certain conditions uh, and it might be less attractive than others. If you really had a distributed database where you're replicating data and you're digitally signing content, then you, you can introduce the immutability and the discovery of alteration, uh, and, you know, unauthorized alteration without necessarily using the blockchain mechanism. Uh, so uh, now let me come back to the, the core of the question, though, is misinformation, disinformation, and other abusive behaviors. I will sort of augment the question for the good of all mankind here. 
Uh, there are lots of things that people can do on the net that are very harmful, including the distribution of malware and the, the launch of denial of service attacks, uh, and uh, and also the use of, of um, social media. Uh, and here I'd like to argue that the social media are the things that are most frequently exercised in order to um, uh, amplify the effects of misinformation and disinformation. Uh, and this is turning out to be an extremely hard problem to solve. Uh, the platform is largely neutral. So if you think of YouTube and uh, Facebook and uh, all the other uh, Twitter uh, platforms, they are generally speaking neutral in, in their form and anybody can inject anything into them. And then the question is, how do you cope with the things that you conclude should not be uh, visible? How do you filter that out? And how do you filter it at scale? So to give you a concrete example, uh, we estimate that there are 400 hours of video per minute uploaded into YouTube. Just, just think for a minute about what that means, 400 hours per minute uploaded into YouTube. So there's no way that a cadre of human beings is gonna be able to look at all that video and do something about it. So we have to invent automated methods. We train those automated methods against videos that you know, we're concerned about. Uh, and then we use machine learning uh, to try to detect other videos that might be similarly um, you know, troublesome. Uh, and then we need to do something about making sure that um, we, uh, that, that we, we uh, detect cases that are false positives. Uh, so this can get into here an example of detecting copyrighted material, whether it's a song or a video or something else. Imagine for a moment that it's a news program. Somebody has taken a clip in order to be concrete about something they're talking about, but the clip turns out to be recognizably copyrighted by something else, and so the system automatically shuts down that particular video. We go through a lot of things like that, and I'm sure that some of our um, colleagues and other uh, application spaces uh, run into similar problems. Let me, let me conclude on this one by saying, A, we clearly have to apply automation. B, we have the problem that um, it won't be perfect, so we have to have a, a way of uh, recovering from false positives. Uh, and th third, I would say that there is also a filter that we could train, which might be even better. It's called wetware up here. Uh, I call it, you know, critical thinking, and I believe people should exercise critical thinking about what they see and hear. Where did this come from? Are there, is there any corroborating evidence to support a claim that's being made? What was the underlying, underlying purpose behind putting this information up? Is someone trying to fool me, persuade me of something that I shouldn't really believe? But that takes work. And so some people aren't willing to put all the work that you should into critical thinking. But I'd like to see kids trained to think that way because, oh, by the way, that's also the way science works, right? You have a hypothesis, you do experiments, and you verify whether or not the experiments justify the hypothesis. And if they don't, you have to discard the hypothesis because that's what science is all about. So, sorry, a really long answer, a hard problem to solve, uh, many different mechanisms uh, for addressing it, none, uh, no one of which is perfect. Okay, thanks for that. The next question is from Reddit user Reelevant. You're sometimes uh, known as one of the fathers of the internet. The question here is, who is the mother of the internet? I love that, that's question number 103. Uh, so the answers are actually are a number of women who were very much involved uh, in the uh, internet's uh, development. Uh, and some of them are finally getting some serious recognition. Uh, I'm not going to try to uh, tick them all off because I'm sure I'll miss one and somebody will be unhappy. But um, that their uh, Radio Perlman, for example, was very involved in the routing uh, architecture and especially on um, uh, doing uh, local area network uh, trees, you know, the routing trees, in order to avoid loops and things of that sort. She also solved one of the really hard problems of network fragmentation, you know, where you have a network and it breaks in the middle, so there are two halves that can't talk to each other, and somebody's routing traffic based on the uh, IP address space of that thing that was supposed to be connected, and it lands on the wrong half. And it can't get to the other side because the network is partitioned. She found a way to dynamically uh, relabel the pieces in order to allow the routing system to discover the two broken halves and allow them to be uh, routed to independently. It's a really beautiful piece of work. 
So, uh, and I mentioned radio because uh, that was uh, visible and very important. Judy Estrin, uh, who is a serial entrepreneur and the daughter of my thesis advisor, was also my student at Stanford in, uh, in her master's program. And she went on to uh, found five or six different companies, many of whom, uh, or of which, were uh, internet related. Uh, so, uh, so the answers are there quite a few. I've not listed more than two here, but there are many more. And I like the thank you for asking the question because I would like to take an action to get more of those women visible uh, in the, in the internet space because they deserve a lot of credit. And uh, this doesn't come from Reddit, but it was a natural follow up question that occurred to me, given the circumstances. Who are the BAME, Black, Asian, and Minority Ethnic Researchers that contributed that go a bit unsung? And, and there are also uh, a number of those. Now, a good place to look uh, for anyone who's listening is the Internet Hall of Fame, because the Internet Society has identified and, uh, uh, and um, how do I say this, sort of highlighted, uh, a great many people who have uh, contributed to the net in its origins and also during its evolution. And so if you simply do a Google search for Internet Hall of Fame, you will find quite a lengthy list of people, men and women, black and different colors and people from different parts of the world. Uh, in almost every country, there is somebody who, who uh, you know, in, in originated the, the uh, implementation of Internet. Usually it was an academic. Uh, in some major university uh, who wanted to be part of the research and engineering network community who pushed the uh, um, introduction of internet in the country. So you'll find lots of those in the Internet Hall of Fame too. Okay. Um, you touched on this before, but here's another Reddit question from the one wondering, what are you most excited about how blockchain will change the internet? Well, I'm not sure that blockchain is really going to change the internet. Um, it is, again, a useful tool for um, aggregating things and binding them in time and space, roughly speaking, or certainly in time anyway. Um, and because those things are, in theory, immutable, uh, nobody can go back and change uh, an important transaction. Uh, nonetheless, there are some issues here, like how long do you have to remember everything? Uh, in the blockchain in order to validate something that occurred a long time ago. Uh, think about some transactions that are important to remember. Real estate transactions, for example. Historically, we've kept records for hundreds of years, sometimes even longer than that. And it's been important to have knowledge of what those transactions were and who was involved in them. The same argument could be made for healthcare information because uh, it might be very important to know what your condition was when you were younger in order to understand the situation you've gotten into when you're older, uh, or for doing horizontal evaluations of particular conditions and the response to drugs and things like that. Financial transactions often have to re be remembered for legal reasons for at least in, in the US, for example, seven years in the case of uh, the federal income tax. Uh, or in, in an internal revenue service. So there are reasons why you have to hold on to things for a long time. And the question will be, does the blockchain admit of, uh, of that conveniently and efficiently? Uh, so, so the answer is that um, I see blockchain as simply in, in the application space. Now, the question is, 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 does blockchain have a role to play in more down in the core of the protocols? And I, I have not seen uh, a proposal to use blockchain necessarily in the core, unless, for example, we might be getting into um, domain name assignments or IP address assignments where it's important to know to whom was this assigned and when, and to have a continuous knowledge of who's assigned to this domain name, who is assigned to this address space. So I can imagine a possibility of using it there. At the moment, that's not what's happening right now. It's more conventional uh, databases that are used to maintain that information. OK, thanks for that. Um, yeah, sorry to throw all this blockchain at you, but we are a blockchain company, so I thought I should ask those questions. Um, here's a longer question from my colleague, Neil. The internet's long-term sustainability needs revenues to flow to match where costs are incurred so that no one party is unfairly subsidizing others. 
integrated vertical monopolies. I think that's um, jargon for Google. Uh, put too much power in too few hands. Given the hindsight of what has emerged, what would you have aimed to do differently at the outset to ensure long-term economic sustainability? Well, actually, I would argue that uh, we have long-term economic stability, and look how long this network has been running. We turned it on in 1983. And I was the guy in 1988 who started, when, when it was not permitted for the internet to be used by commercial entities at all, the government-sponsored back homes had an appropriate, uh, appropriate use policy that said no commercial traffic on government uh, back homes. And so when we had four of them at that point, we had uh, ESNet from the Department of Energy, we had NSINet, the NASA Science Internet, we had uh, NSFNet, and of course we had ARPANET. And uh, I decided that we would not see a sustainable internet. We certainly wouldn't see one in which the general public and the private sector would have access if it could only be paid for by the government, which it had been paid for uh, for the first five years of its operation. And so I started lobbying to be allowed to put commercial traffic on the, on the uh, government back loans, not because I was trying to get uh, the government back home to, to subsidize uh, commercial traffic, but I wanted to break the appropriate use policy in order to show the private sector that internet services could be very useful from the private sector point of view. And so I got permission to connect MCI mail to the internet. And of course it was a commercial operation. And as soon as I got that permission and we got the, uh, the uh, interface up between MCI mail and the rest of the internet, all the other commercial email providers said, wait a minute, you know, those MCI guys can't have this special privilege, uh, you know, we want to be connected to, and they got permission to do that. And that same year, it was in 1989 at that point, in that year, three commercial internet services popped up in the U.S., and they became so successful eventually that the NSF uh, team shut down the NSF net. They said, we don't need it anymore because we can buy the service, the universities can purchase the service from the commercial sector. Uh, so the first point is that I believe that uh, the openness of the internet, the freedom to create a piece of internet and find somebody to connect to was vital to uh, its uh, vitality. And if you think about it, uh, we didn't say what business model the internet service providers had to have. We didn't say who they had to connect to. We didn't dictate what the prices were. We didn't dictate terms and conditions for their interconnection. The system was essentially self-organizing. And uh, so on, on this score, I would argue that the network has done very well. We're only 50% penetrated. I accept that we should be farther along, but the uh, economic engine continues. Uh, and in fact, I'm seeing people trying to drive cost out where they can so that people who have less disposable income can have access to the internet. So some of my projects involve getting Native American uh, reservations up on the net, other projects that Google has been involved in uh, to get uh, internet available in India, for example, and other parts of the uh, of the developing world. Uh, so now the, the argument that there are these verticalized companies and somehow that's bad, um, I'm not sure I buy that entirely. I mean, there are things that we need to do, but they have more to do with our concerns about misinformation and disinformation. Keep in mind that uh, that while although Google invests heavily in networking capability, it also interconnects. Uh, on a global scale with an enormous number of different network providers in order to reach uh, potential uh, users of our products and services. And the same is true for, for Amazon and for, uh, for Microsoft, Azure, and so on. So I'm not sure I buy an argument that says the verticality is a bad thing. Okay, fair enough. Uh, here's a question from another colleague of mine, Paulina. Did you expect you would be putting users at risk in any way? And if so, what group of people would you have thought could be most at risk? And again, this is referring to when you were doing the early design of the internet. Uh, so the honest answer is, uh, is that we were not imagining uh, the quite what we see today. Uh, we did see um, social value in the internet. So the notion of social networking is, is not as new as some people might think, uh, although its its appearance around 1972 or so was, uh, I would say, rather simplistic. Distribution lists from email. Then Ray Tomlinson comes up with the idea of email around 1971 or so. 
two years after the ARPANET gets turned on and late in 1969. And of course, we all jump on that because it's a convenient means of computer-mediated communication. You don't have to be both awake at the same time. You can be operating in different time zones and have asynchronous communication. But as soon as that got invented, uh, the next thing that happens is email distribution lists very early on. And I remember the first one I got on was sci-fi lovers. You know, we were all geeks and engineers. We argued over who were the best sci-fi writers and what were the best stories. And so that way it was clear that that was a kind of a social phenomenon. And then the next one I remember getting connected to was called Yum Yum, which was a, uh, a restaurant review uh, that was started at Stanford University and it covered the Palo Alto area and eventually it expanded to broader territory. So we were aware of some of the social aspects of, uh, of internet use and even ARPANET use very early on. On the other hand, as we, as we look at the uh, social networking systems of today where we see Twitter and Facebook and uh, YouTube and so on, um, I had not anticipated, I think, the uh, scale at which those uh, kinds of applications would be operating. The second thing, which I think is relevant as well, is that uh, in the early days of the uh, internet, we didn't anticipate mobile, uh, the kind of mobile computing that, that we have today. Um, and, and I mentioned my packet radio mistakes, for example, but here I'm, I'm trying to speak to something even deeper. So you should know that in 1973, Marty Cooper started working on the uh, handheld telephone. Uh, the same year when Bob Kahn and I started working on the internet. In 1983, Marty turned on the first mobile uh, telephone service, uh, AT&T's uh, telephone service, and, um, and Bob Kahn and I and others turned the internet on in 1983. Uh, but we, we didn't ever come together. They were running in parallel until 2007. I want to give some, some credit to Nokia, which had some pretty smart phones before the iPhone turned, turned up, but the iPhone really triggered uh, a whole new genre of communication. And why is that? Well, first of all, the mobile phone had processing capability, or the iPhone had processing capability, and a camera in addition to its basic application capability. And so the internet and the handheld smartphone were mutually reinforcing enforcing. the mobile phone um, improve the utility of the internet by making it accessible wherever you had a useful mobile phone. And the mobile phone was made more useful by the fact that it had access to all the content of the internet. And so those two technologies have rapidly reinforced each other. And I think a lot of what we see today uh, in the social networking space is partly a consequence of smartphones. It's true that those same applications work on laptops and desktops. But think about the impact of videos and photographs taken with a mobile phone, uploaded by radio to the internet and shared on a social medium. Extremely powerful consequences of that. And so that I did not anticipate. Fair enough. Uh, I'm actually going to go to um, Agles now for another question. OK. So uh, cryptography was brought uh, a number of times in this discussion. And um, so a number of ways to use cryptography right now to secure the internet is uh, very hierarchical. So we have DNS security extension, root certificate authorities, and, and so forth. All these work, assuming like this uh, sort of higher level of trust is uh, safe. So to put it differently, you do have single points of failure. Uh, and that means that we have to trust governments, big technology corporations to provide the infrastructure. And this type of centralization led to problems in the past. And undoubtedly, it will happen again that we will have problems with this. So for this reason, a lot of people advocate for alternatives that attempt to decentralize these functionalities in order to address these issues. So uh, what, what is your take on that? Do you think that the model that is used right now, this hierarchical model, is something that uh, will make the internet safe? or we should look for alternatives? Well, I don't know what the alternatives would be, to be quite honest with you. And I also think that uh, cryptography uh, is our friend in general, uh, although it does not solve all problems. So we should be careful not to make that assumption. 
But if you think a little bit about um, the current uh, uses of cryptography, you'll see that it is scattered around throughout the network. And uh, you alluded to several different places where it can be usefully applied. So uh, our, uh, our uh, the PKI, for example, the routing public key infrastructure, uh, is one way, uh, if we could get everybody to uh, uh, agree to it, uh, is one way of getting better control over the way in which routing is done. Uh, there is a secure BGP a proposal that uh, is coming out of the IETF. Uh, there's end-to-end -end cryptography, which is starting to show up for uh, higher level applications, communication applications and the like. Uh, so I still see cryptography as being a useful tool. And I also do not see that it is entirely centralized at all. I mean, we have the ability to generate public keys uh, in almost any place that we feel the need to do that. We don't have to go to a single place in order to get those keys. Uh, you're correct, however, that, uh, that there are some architectures that are uh, subject to potential um, undermining. So certificate authorities, for example, you can have any number of them you want to. The trouble is some of them can't, should not be trusted, uh, either because of the weakness in which they've implemented the uh, system that holds the keys, or uh, they are compromised because somebody bribed someone to generate a uh, a, a certificate that certifies somebody as being Microsoft, for example, when they aren't, or, or Google or something else. So we've seen various ways in which the trusted third party problem has been undermined. And yet, uh, in my experience, um, trusted third party is almost invariably needed for almost any useful application. So you could say, well, what about self-sovereign, self-generated keys? What's wrong with that? And the answer is, it's, there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, I can use that key to generate, you know, digitally sign things. I can make a list of assertions about myself and I can sign it in such a way that nobody else could have said it but me. The problem is, what's me? And how do you find out how to associate my digitally signed, you know, assertion and my self signed certificate and my you know public and private key. How do I how do you reliably associate that with me? It's it's not that you can't test the assertions. The text of the assertions are digitally signed. You know that they you know you can test that. The question is how do you know if I lied or not? And so you still end up having to go to somebody else and say, I have this stuff from the guy who holds this public key. And here's what he says about himself. But can you help me validate that? Now, do I have to have only one place to go to validate? No, you could have multiple places to go to do that. But it does seem to me that at some point, if we're serious about this, we're probably going to have to establish some regulations that say, here are the terms and conditions under which you can be trusted to make these assertions or to validate these claims. And in order to run a company that does that, you probably have to meet certain criteria. We probably are going to need international agreements about what those criteria are so that digital signatures from two parties who've been granted certificates by two different organizations can trust each other that uh, the uh, certificate granting organizations have, uh, have met all the criteria for uh, trusted uh, operation. Now, there are a few uh, other interesting examples. Dane, for instance, where you put a, a digital certificate into the middle of a, uh, of a uh, zone in the domain name system uh, is another kind of way of discovering a certificate. And it has the interesting property that um, you can't undermine more than just the uh, portion of the domain names, the zone in which that certificate lives. So you can't issue a certificate that's all of Microsoft. You can only issue a certificate that's within a certain part of the domain name system. So I'm attracted to, to these limitations. But I, I, I feel like I could go on and on, but I think I won't. I want to emphasize to people who are listening that cryptography is very important and very valuable. So is strong authentication, the ability to authenticate yourself strongly. I'm a fan of anonymity being available. There are times when anonymity is needed to protect people. On the other hand, I also want very strong authentication that we all agree to so that if I can make it hard for someone to pretend to be me and take actions in my name. I do not want that to be easy. And that's why I want strong authentication. And that's why I believe cryptography is going to be an important part of the solution to that part of the problem. Okay, great. We've had some questions coming in 
uh, while we've done this session. So I'm just going to do a couple of those. Uh, one is from Vector. He refers to the phrase, surf the web. Does that refer to your last name? <laughs> no, it's a, it's a wonderful coincidence, though. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, Jean, Jean, Jean Polly Armour, or Jean Armour Polly, I'm, I'm mixing her name up, um, is the one who wrote an article about surfing uh, the net. And she was speaking about all the content that's in the internet or the World Wide Web. And, uh, and so the article was about surfing the web or surfing the net. And so that particular um, image uh, was introduced uh, long after uh, my you know, participation in the development of the internet. Uh, it's just a delicious coincidence that my name sounds like that. Now, there is another anecdote that's sort of amusing. Uh, around 1989, uh, there was a company called General Atomics in San Diego that did, got involved in the creation of a network uh, to link the research institutions in the San Diego area. And they were going to call it SURFNET, S-U-R-F-NET. And I think that it was an acronym. Uh, and of course, they had, you know, all the advertising campaign you know, with t-shirts and, and, you know, surfing the ocean of information and all this other stuff. And a few weeks before they were ready to turn on uh, the SURFNET operation, they discovered that in the Netherlands, there was already an organization that called itself SURF.NET or SURFNET or something. I guess it was SURF.NET. Um, and the acronym stood for, in Dutch, stood for a nonprofit organization that was serving the academic community. So they said, well, okay, so we can't call ourselves SURFNET. But somebody else said, why don't we call ourselves the California Educational Research Foundation <laughs> Network, CERFNET. And then somebody else said, oh, maybe we should call VIN. So they called me up. And said, Is it okay if we call our network SURFNET? And my first reaction was, gee, you know, what if they screw it up? You know, am I going to be embarrassed about that? <laughs> I, I thought some more about it. I said, wait a minute. People name their kids after other people. And if the kids don't come out right, they don't blame the people they named them after. So I said, sure, go ahead, you know. So I flew out, I flew out to San Diego. Susan Estrada, who was the, the um, executive director of SurfNet at the time, and I took one of these plastic bottles full of glitter, and we smashed it over a Cisco router, and we launched the SurfNet. Cool. Okay, our last question is from Justin Fujimoto, and he says, what was the first game Phil Wadler created on the internet? So I'm going to answer that one, if that's okay. okay. I've uh -huh. threatened to answer it before. And actually, to answer this, um, Heike, could you please run the second video, please? I hope this is happening. Okay, we're back. Okay. Um, right. That's fine. So, that's hey, game everybody, does Space everybody War. know what that was? You tell them. Oh, no, no. You should tell them, Phil. You had a hand. That's Space War. And I mentioned that I met that when I was a sir, student at Stanford, he actually hired me to do a, a demonstration program for the internet. And the demonstration program that was picked was to take Space War, which was one of the very first video games. It was actually running on a couple of um, jukeboxes at Stanford University in the Student Union. We were both uh, reminiscing before about how much we enjoyed playing it there for a, a quarter ago. Right. And uh, it was vector graphics. I can't remember. Did I implement it with vector graphics? I think I did. I, it, I would guess you must have. Also, you, uh, yeah, this was before the days of raster graphics. You, you also had the ability to fold the system so that it uh, folded in on itself. So the spacecraft that left over here came over on the other side. And if you were fighting that's the right. and they didn't know that, you know, you could sneak up on them uh, by going this way. They thought you were running away and you turn around and fired at them from behind. It was really a tricky game. Uh, the whole thing was, was a wonderful uh, demonstration of what you could get away with. It was so much better than Pong. <laughs> Yes, Pong was an older video game, but it was, it was enormous fun. And of course, they're much more sophisticated things now 
but um, give me a chance to play Space War again, and uh, I would do it. I'm sure that must be available somewhere. Well, it, it minus is, the vector graphics. It, it is available at the Computer History Museum on a PDP one. Uh, just outside of the Google complex, it's in it's in the former Silicon Graphics International headquarters, uh, and then we occupy what was uh, Silicon Graphics primary headquarters. So their international one was turned is now turned into the Computer History Museum. So if you should happen to come to the West Coast, I would uh, urge you to pay a visit to the Computer History Museum where you can play Space War to your heart's content. And uh, I should mention that the video that I showed, uh, that's a different implementation of Space War, not the one that I did. And um, neither uh, the one in the student union at Stanford, uh, nor the one I implemented, had the wonderful music that was on that video. So oh, yes. that was a, a bit of an addition. I can't take uh, credit for that. So I think we will stop there. Thank you ever so much. For your time that's been really fascinating thank you to everybody for the great questions and for that time and we'll leave it there thanks so well, much thank you so much phil and agalos i really enjoyed the the session i hope your viewers enjoyed it as well and i hope our paths cross again on the net thank absolutely. you absolutely have a great day